Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Good morning, my name is Tim Glover. I have the pleasure of serving alongside my family on the parking and connections teams. And my wife, Amy, and I are also cohort leaders for the training program. Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter five and verse six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Tim. Well, good morning. Uh, before we dive in today, wanted to update you a little bit. Uh, last week, uh, we just kind of threw out a, a vision uh, for planting, church planting uh, churches uh, as we kind of train those guys up and, and send them out. Uh, and we asked for 100 grand. We were like, man, we'd love to get 100 grand from you, every dollar going to that end. Uh, and about seven or 800 of you actually gave over $600,000 uh, last weekend, which is unbelievable. And so that, you, you never cease to, to blow my mind in regards to your generosity towards kingdom initiatives. And so thank you. Again, just another one of those ways you, you make it a delight to pastor in a time that it can be difficult to pastor. So you just always encourage my heart. Uh, if you're wondering, what are you going to do with the 500 overage? Uh, I'm glad that you ask. Um, we, we had long-term plans uh, to do specific things in regards to funding mechanisms and the number of people that we can plant. And, and so we don't have to wait three or four years to get there now. Uh, we'll be able to kickstart that even this year. And so thank you. Um, and so I, I wish I could say more about kind of the details around that. Uh, e, I'll create work for him. Email Trevor Joy. He can answer those uh, questions. Uh, I've got to preach. So um, my, my father uh, growing up uh, drank Folgers Crystals. Now, I don't, I don't know if you know what that is. It, it's, if you know what instant coffee is, this is not like that, but it's something like that. And, and my dad was a bit of a chemist in, in how he made um, his Folgers crystals. It, it was a precise measurement. You know, you guys with your scales and your all that, you know, distilled water. My dad had a system. It, it was two scoops of the Folgers crystals and then four scoops of sugar. Uh, and then he would stir those things together, and then he would drink this kind of syrupy concoction uh, that he called coffee. A- and this ruined me for coffee uh, until, uh, you know, 10, 15 years later, because if that's coffee, no thank you, right? Because it, I mean, it locked up my jaw. I'm not a, a like sweet forward kind of guy. I prefer bitter up front. And, and, and man, just to drink coffee-flavored syrup is an offense to coffee everywhere. Uh, And this was just normal. Like, I didn't know there were other things. Now, he's gotten a little bougie in his 70s. He's got a French press now. He, I mean, so it was reverse discipleship. Sometimes that can happen where you're like, Dad, let me just, let me help. And and then voila, we're getting there. We're not quite there. He's not measuring anything yet. He's just throwing it all together. And, but we're, there's growth. Uh, Another thing that was true uh, growing up is we were sauce people. Let me try to explain sauce people. Sauce people means that regardless of the meat, you just cook it until it's done done. And then you've got to put sauce on it in order for it to actually be able to make its way down your esophagus into your stomach. Now, I'm fully expecting to hear from my parents. I have not given them an FYI. I'm bringing this up. Uh, So mom, call me. I love you. I'm not lying. So a little A1, ketchup, whatever. Um, And so when Lauren and I began to date. One of our first dates, she ordered a steak rare. I didn't know what that meant. I literally thought I was in love with this woman. I was like, I, I'm not gonna be able to recover from this. They're gonna put just like a bloody slab of meat and I'm gonna watch the, it is gnaw on a bloody piece of meat. And you don't come back from that, man. You certainly don't stay with the woman who does that. How terrifying is that? And, and so I was somewhat surprised when they brought it. And I was like, oh, you know, Rare's actually cooked some. And I still can't get there with her. You know, it's, I can't. If it's cold in the middle, you ruined it. But, um, but I am medium rare. No sauce. And here's what's funny about both of those things. 
right here. Thank you, Deb. Deb's worshiping. Now, here's what's funny about both of those things. Um, one, I, I, if, you, if you cook a steak medium, you ruined it. Like, I'm going to send it back to you and ask you, please don't spit it. It's just like, hey, you just overcooked it a little. I'm not dropping this kind of coin on a medium. I'm going to need you to do me another one of those. And, and I don't want any sugar anywhere near my coffee. I, I don't. You, it's, it's like the sauce rule, man. You, I got to put sugar in it. You brewed it wrong. Right. And, and so what, what happens is, is we get, we get these tastes and, and these tastes begin to define what we're drawn to, and what we're not drawn to. Right. Like I know that, that black coffee is what I want. I, I don't want no whipped cream on it. I don't need no chocolate in my coffee. Now, maybe you do. Maybe we got different tastes. Maybe you're like, actually, pastor, I think you're wrong. Right. I need some caramel and some frap in that mug. Maybe some sprinkles on top and then go be you. I try not to drink calories. Uh, look at that. I'm trying to keep this, yo. <laughs> Fighting the fight. I'm about to be 47. That tire, that thing's trying to get me, man. That tire's trying. We don't have time for this. <laughs> One of the things that, that I find fascinating about the idea of appetites and, and what we're drawn to and what we think are gross is they really are formed over time and they, what we desire and what we're hungry for um, both sends us to certain spaces and makes us say no to other things. And, and this concept is not just a physical reality. It's how the Bible likes to talk about spiritual maturity. Like what you're hungry for, where your appetites are, actually reveal whether you're on a trajectory of maturation or, or you're devolving, if you will, back into infancy uh, is really the, the arguments from the scripture that, that you either grow in your palate towards the things of God or you get stuck drinking from a bottle the rest of your life. And I'm not talking about a good bottle of bourbon. You tracking with me? I mean like a baby bottle. So let me, let me show you this. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, talks about unbelievers in this way, people who don't love and follow Jesus Christ. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their what? Their belly. They're driven by their um, primal impulses, lust, more, the insatiable, I have to have it, scarcity mindset that sin shapes into us. There's never enough, so I got to get mine, right? So Paul's going to say, an unbeliever, an enemy, those who walk as enemies of Christ are driven by their bellies. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. For even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? And, and again, in Hebrews 5, 11 through 13, about this, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull in hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. What's happening here in these rebukes is there's a picture being painted of us not maturing at the right rate not growing into what, what he calls solid food, but rather still on milk, right? We're still in our flesh. This is fascinating because these people are Christians. This is written to people like you and I who know Christ. In fact, Paul affirms it. You're in Christ. You're just a baby. You're, you're in Christ. You're just still on the bottle. So oftentimes I've, I've thought, uh, this is like a grown man playing in the kiddie pool by himself. Right? It's just like you're not going to let your three year old go play in the kiddie pool if there's like a 50 year old man in there with some floaties on having fun. 
Like I get it if he's just kind of lay, even if he's laying in the pool. No, like I ain't letting my kids play in the kiddie pool. You got a grown man having a good time in there. I'm probably calling somebody. And Paul is trying to draw our attention to there is a way of maturation that leads to meat eating. There is a way of maturation. And so you also get a picture of what it means to be matured, skilled in the word of righteousness is what he says. The absence of strife, the presence of unity. So this is not just a rebuke of what is immature, but a picture of what is mature. And so what I want to do today is simply this. Uh, I'm believing that if you're here today, there is a certain level of a hunger and thirst for righteousness, That, that you are hungry to become more like Jesus, that you have a thirst for the things of God. If not, what the text says about you is true. You are driven by your belly. The beautiful part of the promise here from Jesus is this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he'll define righteousness later in chapter five and verse 20. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? Because they'll be satisfied. They will be full. That's a, that's a great promise. Now, he, if I could get you to take one thing away from my 40 minutes with you this morning, here, here's it. Here's the, the one thing. If I could drive out of your head this morning that what God is after is you being perfect and instead replace it with what he honors, what he delights in is a hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, here, here's what I believe. If you won't rely on the perfection of Christ... And instead, you need to be perfect. You need to be the perfect husband. You need to be the perfect wife. You need to be the perfect Christian. You need to be the perfect mom or dad. You need to be the perfect. Then there'll always be distance between you and the Lord. Always. But if you can rest, and we'll get to this, if you can rest in what he says about you, you you can rest in his forgiving, saving grace. You can rest in his delight and, and you can shift gears away from, let me try to be perfect and instead, let me cultivate as best I can a hunger and thirst for righteousness that all over the Bible and all the heroes of the Bible, that's what they have. Not perfection, they're deeply flawed people meant to encourage us. And you just watch this play out over and over and over again. I'm going to give you two, and then I want to get into my text. Moses. Moses is a murderer with a temper. Do you know your Bible? He is a murderer with a temper. And it's not like once his temper is solved, then God starts to use him. A murdering man with a temper is actually used by God, and that's disorienting because as much as we want to argue against it, God does not need our perfection in order to flow through us with power. It's actually that belief that I think is going to rob you from ever experiencing the power of God in your life. So you got Moses, killed a guy, still has a temper, and God offers him, God's over it. So he offers him, I'm going to give you the promised land. I'm going to make you wealthy. I'm going to give you cities and lands and wealth and comfort, but I'm not going. I'm sending an angel with you. I'm done. What does Moses say? No, thank you. I don't want that. I want you. I don't want that. I want you. If you're not coming, you can keep wealth. You can keep comfort. You can keep long life. What I want is you. I will not go into the promised land without you. If you're staying here, I'm staying here. Do you hear it? Hunger, thirst. I want you. Not I want what you can give me. Because what God was doing is going, here, take my gifts. And what did Moses say? I don't want your gifts. I want you. I don't want your gifts. I want you. And then we see it again in David. (laughs) David, if we could just put it nicely, keep in mind, we're just putting it nicely. David's guilty of adultery and murder. That's not, that's, I'm, I'm sugarcoating that, right? I really am. How can this man be called a a man after God's own heart by God? What is God like about David? It's a man after my own heart. You serious? Like the, the adulterer murder guy, that's a man after your own heart. Yes, because this same man says this, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. My my soul thirsts for you like a dry and weary land where there is no water. When can I meet with you, God? 
One thing I ask in all that I seek is that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord in his temple. What what is that? That's a hunger, a thirst. So I want to try to reorder how you're thinking about life and go, no, no, no. God's not after your perfection. He actually gives you perfection. What's meant to be cultivated is a heart that hunger and thirsts for righteousness. Why? Because they will be filled. So here, here's the question. Assuming that you're here today and, and there is some inkling, maybe you're just on a bottle, maybe you're on that mashed up gross food, right? I, mean, I don't know where you are. Maybe, man, you've been at this 30 years every night, like T-bone and cab every night. Like what I want to do is kind of lay before you, uh, I think, things that, that stir up a greater appetite, a, a greater kind of thirst, for the things of God. So, so that's it. Four things, and, and I'm going to move fairly quickly. Now, here, I want to lay this before you. Um, I'm not going to say anything new. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything you don't know. What I've prayed for all week is the gap between what you know and what you'll practice actually shrinks a little. I'm just telling you, I, there's literally, I'm not saying a thing today that's going to make you go, I have never thought of that. I promise you. I don't think, I think even if you're not a Christian and this is your first time in a church ever, I don't think I'm going to say anything. You're like, that really shocked me, right? So what does it look like to have hunger and thirst cultivate in us if that's what pleases God? Here's the first thing. Actively read the Bible. Not passively read the Bible, actively read the Bible. That's not the same thing. You hear me? Passively reading the Bible is reading the Bible like it's a newspaper or a blog or your favorite magazine or no, no, no. We actively read. Now, what am I talking about? When we come to the word of God, we're asking the Holy Spirit to do the work of illumination, which is great because the spirit of God lives inside of you if you're a follower of Christ. And here's what we're going to see. We're going to see who God is. You don't have to guess who he is. He's revealed himself to you. You don't have to trust your intuition. In fact, I would beg you not to trust your intuition. Well, I think God is like means a hill of beans. I wouldn't trust that impulse in you. God has revealed himself. When we come to the word of God and we read it actively, show me who you are, reveal to me. You're going to see the steadfast love of God. You're going to be moved by his faithfulness. Weird things are going to strike you, like the fact that he never sleeps. You know how awesome it is to go to bed at night and know he's not going to bed? To leave your office and know that he'll continue to work for his good pleasure and your joy? You know, good. I, I do a physical weird. When I leave my office, on, I literally put my hands on my desk and I thank God that all that's undone, he'll continue to work on. And that all that I didn't get done today, he will continue to work in and through. And then I'm going to leave it there so I can go home and be a husband and a daddy. Right? Like those are the weird, like that's God showing himself to us as wonderful, as loving, as all powerful, as steadfast. I mean, you want to watch uh, him be patient with people and then believe he can be patient with you. That's in the book. And then I love this because you put these two together and I think you just crush the works of the enemy. We see who God is when we actively read the word of God and look around me. We see who we are. We see who we are. And when you see who he is and what he says about you, I think you can absolutely just destroy the work of the enemy in your life. The primary work of the enemy in your life is to accuse you and deceive you and effectively take you out of understanding how God sees you and what he says about you. But when you're actively reading the word of God and you get a right view of God and you begin to see how God talks about you, sees you, plans to interact with you, then I think the enemy's schemes are undone. His power is nullified and that you and I actually begin to walk in victory. Like, what would it be like to meet every accusation with realities like, there's no condemnation for me in Christ Jesus? What would it be like when you, when that thought flashes across your mind that you're not a good enough man and you're not a great mom and you're a terrible mother or you're a failure as a father? What would it be like to meet every one of those with, I'm a friend of Jesus, get out of my face. I am beloved by the God of the universe. What would it be like to to match the accusation with I? My old self has been crucified with Christ. 
Anybody got some stuff back there? You know what I'm saying? Anybody got some stuff back there that pops up in your head every once in a while? Tries to steal something from you? I don't know, but I got some stuff, man. Nasty stuff. And here's what's great when I can feel the enemy kind of roll that into the front of my mind. The book tells me that Matt Chandler died a long time ago. So he's like, well, what about this? I'm like, no problem. That dude got killed. What else you want to do to him? He's dead. I mean, you can beat on a dead man if you want. He ain't going to complain about it. Like that Matt Chandler was crucified with Christ. This one, he no longer lives, right? And now he lives by faith in the son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. That's being armed for the fight. Where does the enemy go from there? Like you, you rob him his primary weapon simply by knowing what the Bible says about you. I'm a friend of Jesus. I'm a child of God. I'm a priest in the household of God. I am like, this is what actively reading the Bible does. If you actively read the Bible, am I saying every morning, midway through Leviticus, the Holy Spirit's going to meet you in power? Some mornings. Not, <laughs> I have a friend in here just pointing at me because she had brought up a, a passage in Leviticus. Anyway, I don't have time for this. Don't do that again, Lindsay. So uh, in, in the end, when we actively, when we open the book and we're like, I want to meet with you. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to kind of put a bunch of knowledge in my, I, I want to meet with you. Want, show me who you are. Show me who I am. Strengthen me to love you and follow you. Continue to stir me. Like this starts to fuel a hunger and thirst for rightness, a hunger and thirst for righteousness. I see you. I delight in you. I understand what you are doing in me and why you can be trusted in what you're doing in me. And, and it just makes us more and more hungry, more and more thirsty. I also think what happens when you um, start to um, actively read the Bible is you'll see the foolishness uh, of trusting yourself over God. The, listen, the Bible is a grimy, grimy book. It is not a children's book. That thing is grimy and it is filled. In fact, th this is kind of the MO of e almost every hero in the Bible sans Jesus is to begin trusting God have a point of crisis, decide to take matters into your own hands, and, and then face the whirlwind from turning your back on God and trying to do it your own way. Now, you watch that story over and over and over again as you actively read the Bible in your day of crisis, when you've, and it's coming, and you feel that pull towards, let me manage this, let me get my hands around this, let me take this, you go, wait, no, all the morons in the Bible do that. I'm going to try not to do that. God, I don't want to be like Abraham that like tried to whore out his wife as his sister three or four. I don't want to do that. Right? Do you know that about Abraham? Not the best husband in the book. Right? Or we could just keep going. I don't have a lot of time. But this is what they all follow this MO. Moment of crisis. Let me take matters into my own hands rather than let me go to this good, gracious, kind God and ask for mercy and help and strength. Right? So, so you want to grow in a hunger and thirst for righteousness? You want happy are those, blessed are those, full are those, satisfied are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? And we have to actively be in the word of God. We have to actively be in the Bible. Now, no one in this room didn't know that. Even if you're not a Christian, you're not going, wait, what? You guys have sacred literature? No, you know. So what's the gap? I'm glad you asked that question because that actually leads me to my second point. Not only if we're going to hunger and thirst for righteousness, not only do we need to actively read and understand the word of God. This is, this is so simple. You have to obey what you know. He, here's a, this is a troubling thing to me. I, I meet all sorts of people that want to see the power of God in their lives, to walk in the power of God in their lives and have no desire to actually do what he tells them to do. You want, I'm just, I'm trying to help you. You want to see the power of God in you and through you. This is going to sound crazy to you. Be obedient to what you know. The experience of grace and the affection of God in the deep places is felt most frequently and consistently out of our comfort zone and into acts of faith that line up to God's commands on our lives. In the same way that your physical appetite is oftentimes conformed by the benefit of what you consume. 
So I know you like the taste of coffee, but you also like that. You also like that little kick it gives you, don't you? Right? It ain't just about the taste. Come on. Anybody, anybody done the whole 30 in here? Or let's, let's call it the whole 22. I don't know how far you made it. All right. So, so here you'll see people like, like they just, they, they all of a sudden talk like the whole 30 is just like, uh, like some kind of miracle. I don't know if you've been around people that do the whole 30, like, oh my gosh, I slept so well. Like I started healing like Wolverine. I actually cut myself. I just watched my skin close back over it. I had such clarity of thought. Right? I mean, right? Have you been around whole 30 people? This is what they talk like. It's just like a miracle. Right? And, and then what ends up happening is, is when you experience the benefit of specific things, it, it actually empowers and emboldens more of it. So you realize, man, you getting up in the morning, drinking that coffee. Oh man, that gave you like, let's go. You, you eat clean for a while. You start to feel the benefits and it reinforces the strengths. Maybe I, I shouldn't eat seven uh, chocolate sea salt car- caramels at 1030 at night. You know, maybe you should just stop that. Maybe you don't, but you at least have the thought, right? And, and so it reinforces um, what, and, and the same thing's true spiritually. Like when you step out in faith, and be obedient to what you know. You have now positioned yourself to experience the power of God in you and through you. And after 30 years, nothing I've experienced is more joy stirring and worship encouraging than seeing that God can use a lanky fool like me. Right? Because I think, I think you don't believe that God can use you in powerful ways. I think you don't. I, I don't think you believe it. I think you believe that's for somebody else. I believe that's for people like them or people like them or people like them, but not like me. God couldn't give me a vibrant, powerful prayer life. God couldn't use me to encourage and build up others. God couldn't use me to see others become Christians and followers of Christ. That's for the professionals. That's for these. And I'm just going, says who? Right? But you'll never know if you won't take a step of faith. Um... I've got, one of my children has, maybe you're, you've got a, a kid with this disorder, but it's, it's called delayed obedience. I don't know. It's terrible. It's a, it's a very painful thing. I don't know if you've got, it's, it's not that they're disobedient. It's just that they take a long time to get obedient, right? So you're like, hey, will you, will you do this? They're like, yeah, I'll get on it. And like an hour later, like, hey, um, I ain't trying to ride you or anything, but I was about to. Oh, oh my bad. I should have known. Right, it's delayed, OB. It's just like, I'll eventually get to it. Right? But listen, tell me that's not how we play our relationship with God. I want you to confess this. I want you to give this. I want you to go here. I want you to live like this. I want you to engage your neighbor like this. I want you to think about the gap between what you know and what you do. What is that but delayed obedience? What is that but you saying to the Lord, I'll get to it? God. Ah. I'll get to, I'll, I'll, be, I'll give me some time I'm trying to finish this up first, right? That's all I'll say. We'll just move on. Actively reading the word of God, obeying what you know. Number three, prioritizing relationships that stir our desire for the things of God. Let's, let's, I'm sorry you are going to become more and more and more like the people you spend the most time with. This is God's design. It is unavoidable. If you spend all of your time with half-hearted, sit on the sideline, Jesus is somewhere on my calendar, but isn't my life, you will become more and more like that. And the more you prioritize relationships that are all about Jesus, that you always end up somehow talking about the things of God, zealously hoping for these things to be happening around you, the more you're going to become more and more like that. This is what the author of Hebrews is saying in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near What we do continually and together shapes us. What we do continually and together shapes us. I'm 
saying, if you want to have your affection stirred for Jesus and you want to grow in a hunger and thirst for righteousness, you must prioritize. I'm not asking you to break up with anybody. I'm not asking you to take your friends now that this isn't go to dinner and be like, it's just not working out. It's us. It's not you (laughs) or the dreaded. If you're single in here, the dreaded God told me to break up with you. Uh, Like, come on. Right? I'm not asking you to break up with me. I'm just saying you should be prioritizing the relationships that fuel and feed a hunger and thirst for righteousness in your life. And you should be asking the Lord to turn you into the kind of people that when people are around you, they are encouraged, right? It's way too easy to take this verse and go, oh, that's church attendance. Don't neglect the gathering. I'll be there on Sunday morning. Well, it's bigger than that. It's not about Sunday morning. It's about life. And I'm just wondering how many of us get stuck in a herd of indifference. A a herd that has lost their way. Good people just drinking from a bottle. Just drinking from a bottle. prioritize relationships. So we're actively reading the word of God. We're obeying what we know. We're prioritizing relationships that stir our affections and fuel our appetites. And then the last thing, we will spot our idols and starve them. This is Isaiah 55, one through three. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine, that's joy, and milk, strength, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Two quick questions. We're almost there. What kills your appetite for the things of God? Let let me paint a picture for how it works. Um, Emotions are such a great gift of God's grace. I, I don't know if I come across like this, but I'm a feeler. Feel stuff deeply. Uh, and intensely. So I, I'm a feeler. I'm, if, if there's a below the line and above the line, I'm a below the line kind of brother. Like I, I want to feel those things are important to me. Um, but emotions will lie to you like crazy, won't they? So, so let, me, let me paint a picture of like in my walking with a great number of you in this room, uh, like, like I, we'll have some kind of emotional flair. So the most frequent, um, anger or loneliness. It'll come out of nowhere. We don't know where it comes from. It's just kind of this weird compulsion than we have. So, so we'll wake up and let, let's see if this resonates. You, you wake up and you know, nothing's really happened, but you're just like, it's just that day, man. Like everything's already, it just starts off bothering you. It's not like something happened. It's just like something was going to happen because you woke up that way. Right? Or maybe it's not angry. Maybe it's, you're just prone to melancholy. You know, and you just wake up and it's like, ah, oh, why is life so hard? What do, you, what do you mean? You just got out of bed. Yeah, but... Right? So, so what happens is, is that kind of moment, and, and I've said this a lot, I, I want to keep saying it. Um, what's great about emotions is, is they're kind of this, like this, either you can call it a spiritual MRI, it, you can call it a check engine light. And so what you do next when that light comes on reveals whether you have an idol that needs to be starved or... You've got a savior who you're trusting in. So you know how easy it is when that thing happens, that thing that I don't quite understand, but it's there and it, it, it's nasty. It's angry. It's lonely. It's lustful. It's whatever it is. I, I don't know what flares in you. I'm saying anger and loneliness are the two most prevalent in, in our work here, our ministry here. You know how easy it is in that moment when we feel that just to grab a drink? You know how easy it is in that moment just to get the bluebell out of the freezer? I'm not, I'm not dogging a drink or bluebell. Those are gifts of common grace given to all men. I like, how amazing is God that even people who hate him get bluebell? Right? I'm being serious. 
You know how easy it is in that moment just to fire something up on Netflix? You know how easy it is in that moment when that's happening and we're discombobulated and we don't know what to do with it and we can't fix it just to numb it out? And everything we're trying to numb it out with is bread and wine that will not satisfy. Because what happens to that angry anger after a couple of drinks? What, what happens to that loneliness after you binge Stranger Things 4? Does it go away or does it get worse? Right? The promise is I can take that away from you and it's lying because it's demonic and it's an idol. It's betraying you. Right? Just have a drink. Just turn on the TV. Just scroll for the next, right? It, it's lies. It's pulling us in to take us away from the one place we might actually start to starve and put to death the root of what's going on inside of us. Do you see what's happening here where, um, man, we are actively reading the word of God. We are being obedient to what it says. We are surrounded by people who bring us life in this space. We're not running in a herd of indifference. We're, We're running in a herd of flame. And then we're looking for ways that we, oh, I want to run to you. I don't want to run to those things. And we'll stumble and fall along the way, but we'll have these people in our lives who who are there to quickly pick us back up, to point our face back to where it belongs, to remind us what we know to be true in the word of God and to call us back into the fight as we lean again in the grace and mercy of God. So so here's, here's how I want to end. There's just no question that you and I are in a unique moment in history at least the history of our nation. We are in the middle of cultural disintegration. Everybody see it? And you're going, oh, you're crazy. You can't even watch Nickelodeon anymore. I mean, we've lost our mind. And it's getting darker, not lighter. And, and then look out, because I want to say it again. I've been saying it to you for a year. I'm going to say it again. We were made for a moment like this. Where is salt and light more necessary than with eclipsing darkness and decay. Salt as a preservative. Light shining into the darkness. We have got, by the grace of God, to close the gap between what we know and what we live. We were made for this moment. It has been given to us. It's not been given to our parents or our grandparents. Different day, different fights. We've got a unique one. So what does it look like to live in to this moment as the people of God? What does it look like? I can't, I can answer this for us. I can't answer it for you. You, you, God's placed you in a specific domain where you work. He's, he's put you in a specific neighborhood. He's given you specific abilities and gifts. So there's a, there's a sense in which we, we were made for this moment, us, the village church, but then you have to consider as a part to the whole, what it looks like for you to live into this. So, so I just want to lay it before you. Maybe, because like I've already said, we're all over the place here. Like some of you have been following Jesus faithfully for 20 years. Some of you, this is week two. (laughs) And that's different. Like don't, if you're on the bottle because you're supposed to be on the bottle, you shouldn't feel bad about that at all. You just look forward to me. Like, I heard that's amazing. When do I get there? You'll get there. Just keep drinking that bottle. Right? Or maybe you're in the mashed up food season. You know, like, I can only take too much and then, you know, everything gets overwhelming. Or, or you might, like I said, be like every night is T-bone and cab. Congrats. That's awesome. Where do you need to step in cultivating greater hunger, greater thirst for the things of God? So, so maybe you haven't actively been reading the Bible. Maybe you've been reading the Bible for years, but not actively. You haven't opened it up and come with great expectation that the Spirit of God would show you something about God, something about you. Strength for the journey. Strength. Show, show me from your word, Spirit of the living God, who you are, Father, who you are, Jesus. Show me how you see me. Order my life around your revealed word. What would it look like to read the Bible that way? Versus going, oh, this is my passage for this morning. Check. That's not eating. That's smelling. We don't want to smell. We want to eat. Right? 
if that's you, here's what, let's just spend time this week feasting on the word of God. It's not a race, man. Don't, you don't gotta read 40, like you ever got one of those Bible reading plans, like two hours of Bible, it's like read these nine chapters and these 42 chapters this morning. Like slow down. Like just get a chunk, read it slow, meditate on it. Ask the Holy Spirit to be, I would just start with the gospel of John this week. If you, do, if you just don't have any bear, just start with the gospel of John. Read about 15 verses at a time, slowly, intentionally. Ask the Holy Spirit to do work in you, to show you, to stir you, to move you. That's how you read the Bible. It is an active process, not a passive process. Or, or maybe for you, it's just, you got that delayed obedience syndrome. And it's just been a long time. The Lord's been on you. You need to confess this. You need to step into this. You need to engage your neighbor like this. You need to seek forgiveness in this. You need to look at your finances like this. You need to take this step of faith. And, and you've just kind of dug in your heels. I'll get to it. Well, maybe today could be the day you get to it. Oh, or maybe you are just surrounded by indifference. Like I said, I don't know that you've got to break up with anybody. But what would it look like for you to prioritize, right? Because there's only so much time that we have, right? And goodness sakes knows that all our kids need to be all over the state. So like, what, what does it look like to just go, I'm going to prioritize a set of relationships that stir me on and up into the things of God. And then lastly, let me ask this question and then I want to pray for us. What does it look like to starve your idols? What does it look like next time that compulsion's there, that um, I, just want, I just want to drink and to sit on the couch, I just want to binge something, I just want to turn it all off. What would it look like instead to go, no, 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 let me starve that and go to the place where we can do some work in this area. Now, you, let me give you a second. You, you need to pray about these things. You, you need to have an answer for these things as we end our service today. It's not enough for you to know this stuff. Like I said, I don't think anybody in here went, oh, I'm supposed to read the Bible. Oh, I'm supposed to be obedient to what God says. Did that really shock any of you? I have, you, you have better not been here long if you just got shocked by be obedient to what God says. I, I hope that didn't happen here today. I think you probably knew prioritize relationships that stir you up. We just get lost in it. Right? The drift is not towards a, a well-armored life that can keep punching Satan in the face. The, the drift is towards indifference. The drift is towards comfort. The drift is away from the things of God, which is why we fight with the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, to armor ourselves up for the day and age in which we live. So what does it look like for you to actively move towards him today? So why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to try to help us in this space. How many of you would just say, oh, Matt, if I'm honest, I'm in the book, I'm reading the Bible, but it certainly hadn't been active. I've just kind of, it's just been routine and I'm just kind of reading and checking it off. And I need to just recommit today to coming to the scriptures with great expectation. If that's you, would you just lift your hand where you are? I just need to come to the book with great expectation. Praise God. Great. Now, go ahead and put your hands down. Maybe you're in this place and you're like, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little frustrated with you, Pastor. I have, I've got some delayed obedience going on in my life. I clearly know the Lord's asking me to do something. It, it's stressful for me. It makes me nervous. So I've not done it. And I need, just need the grace and the courage to obey today. That's me. I've just got something I've got to be obedient to. Would you raise your hand if that's you? All right. Praise God. Why don't you go ahead and put your hands down then? Maybe what the situation today is, man, I am surrounded by indifference. And I need to reprioritize my time, my energy, the, the, the people that we're running with and get people in our lives that stir us up towards the things of God. If that's you, why don't you just raise your hand? I need to prioritize some relationships that are gonna stir me. Praise God. Go ahead and put your hands up. Now, lastly, I need to starve some idols in my life. I don't go to the Lord. I go to other places. And I, maybe I named that place. Maybe it's a place I don't know anything about. But if that's you right now, just go, I need to starve some idols in my life. Why don't you raise your hand? All right. Praise God. 
Let me pray for us. Father, you know the hearts. You've seen the hands. Spirit of, the God, I, Spirit of God, I just pray that you minister to your people today. You've seen the hands that said, man, I have not been active in reading. I have not been active in obedience. I have not surrounded myself with those who speak life and good deeds into me. I have gone to the wrong wells to be satisfied. I have purchased bread that doesn't satisfy. I have purchased water that does not quench my thirst. Pray you strengthen them this morning. Give them the courage to be obedient. Let the Bible come alive to them as they read this afternoon, tomorrow morning, tonight, whenever it is. Help us. We need you. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.